Thank you for joining in. Um, I believe we have folks from all over the world. I know I have some friends from Australia joining in, so good morning, in which case. Um, thank you all so much for, for being with us. Um, <clears throat> my name is Nicole Raglan, photographer, filmmaker, and director of the film Farmer's Footprint, uh, Regeneration, the Beginning. Um, it's pretty, it's hard to believe that we, we're two years out from releasing this film and, and so much has happened since. I've been um, graced to stay in touch with Grant and Don over the last couple, couple of years and have learned so much from them in terms of their trajectory um, in this process and um, very grateful to have them with you all and to share more of their story. Um, <clears throat> just a few points of business. This is being recorded and um, we will follow up with a replay uh, as soon as it's ready. Um, you all can put your Q&A in the chat room and we will try our best to, to get to those questions. Um, we only have an hour and a half. There's a lot to, a lot to get to. There's so much to Grant and Dawn's story and, and I know there's gonna be so many questions coming in. So do be patient with us. We'll try our best to, to get to all the questions, but um, also we'll try and follow up after the fact, after our hour and a half. So um, bear with us on that. Um, I just want to share uh, a little bit of just my own path in terms of, of telling this story and learning so much from Grant and Dawn and, and really the beginning of working with, with Zach and his wife, Jen, and our friend Hunter when we set out to tell this story uh, in the very beginning about two and a half years ago, I guess. Um, oftentimes, if not probably most of the time when you're telling a documentary and go into the story and have an idea of what that story is gonna be. And in this case, Zach um, had a thought that this was gonna be specifically about the science and the chemicals and, and the impact by virtue of conventional ag and um, agricultural runoff into the Mississippi and consequently the dead zone. Um, and we quickly learned the importance of this being a story about the farmers. Um, we learned many farmers in the middle of, of February in Minnesota driving all the way down the Mississippi from Iowa into Louisiana. <laughs> um, a very cold trip um, at the time, <laughs> thinking back on it. Um, and so in so doing, really learning the importance of, of turning our farmers into heroes. Um, there's been a, a tremendous amount of propaganda and marketing within the storyline of conventional agriculture um, as we're all well aware, um, conventional ag has told the story that we have to feed the world through GMOs, uh, very much a false story. <laughs> um, and so by virtue of, of learning from Grant and Dawn, as well as so many far farmers along the way, I think it's, it's just so very imp important that we highlight the specifics of these folks and specifically to Grant and Dawn's juncture at the time when we found them about two and a half years ago, um, essentially a juncture of, of moving from conventional ag and in their case, fourth, fifth generation farmers and um, the, the specifics of what that challenge is, that challenge in terms of, of business and cultural pressures and ideas from bank lenders and seed dispersal and uh, equipment and I mean, even culturally within your local bar and even local churches, that is something that I want us to get into with Grant and Dawn, um, but it's just a really important understanding for us to realize just the, the, the challenges of transitioning into regenerative practices. So, um, so much to get into, so much, so much. So I wanna um, just begin just so that you all have a good understanding of Grant and Dawn and where they're operating from. Um, their particular location in Redwood Falls, Minnesota is um, one of the highest agricultural production areas in the world. So it's really significant to learn not only Grant and Dawn, but what's happening surrounding them, um, certainly within the states, but also um, across the globe. Um, they are, their farm is called Stony Creek Farm. And like I said, based in Redwood Falls, Minnesota, they're running about 430 acres of row crop land and 935 acres of pasture land. Um, they've been working over the past 23 years and have converted a conventional crop and calf cow operation. Um, <clears throat> and 
uh, essentially into a multi-enterprise regenerative family business. Um, their crops include at least a three crop rotation with the incorporation of cover crops whenever possible and their 100% no-till cropping system, which is so good to hear, well done. Um, the they, cattle are grazed across nearly every acre throughout the year. Uh, they use adaptive multi-paddock grazing throughout their pasture systems and they can now graze uh, significantly longer with many more head than ever before. Um, their daughter Carly and husband Cody have added a direct marketing enterprise featuring the family's beef, pork, chicken, and eggs, of which can be found at Ten Creek Range at Stony Creek on Facebook. Um, that's been amazing to learn over the last couple of years. When we were there about two and a half years ago, I think Carly was pasting her logo on the side of the track, <laughs> which is pretty cool to see that uh, she's essentially in such high demand you can barely keep up. So that's one of the things that I want to I want to jump into. Um, <clears throat> I think I want to go back a little bit before before we get into what's happened since the film. Um, like I said, it's it's really such a specific juncture for farmers to to start questioning their operation. And many people like yourselves, I think you told me that all of a sudden you realized that half your cattle were sterile and that was essentially your canary in the coal mine. Um, and that's when you really started asking questions. And, and from what I learned um, in your dynamic, which is often the case is that um, it's the woman that starts nudging her partner, her husband, saying, you know, what's going on here and what are we doing, which is essentially what happened between Don and Grant. Um, so if you all could start with that, I think that would give a good window into, you know, that specific time frame and, and what, it, what that meant to you in terms of starting the transition. So when Don and I took over from mom and dad, it was... Um... The simplest way to explain it is we were still focused on production, production, production. How many pounds of beef could we get per acre? How big our calves could be? How many bushels per acre we could produce? So we were using all the latest and greatest technology to do it. And like you mentioned, Nicole, when 30% when of our cows came up open and 50% of my brother's cows came up open, um, we were blessed to meet a nutritionist that helped us out a lot, opened our eyes to exactly what we were feeding our cattle. And there was, there was many other things that happened along the way, but that was the big one that if we didn't figure this out, we weren't gonna stay doing what we love doing. Um, so we, so we, we, we educated ourselves with the help of him and others. I mean, we were already, we weren't looking at soil health. We were already looking at managed grazing and increasing grass production once again we were just looking at production 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 but along the way the good lord opened our eyes and showed us that it was all about soil health and regenerating the land and that's primarily primarily what our focus has been for about the last 12 to 15 years is trying to fix what our forefathers and and we in our early career did to the land to degrade it and what was what was your first step? What what was that what was that beginning first step that you knew that you had to take at that point? Um, right right then and there, when we had the issue with the main cow herd, was we knew we had to figure out how to get away from GMO crops. That that was emphasized by our nutritionist, the guy that helped us out, that saved our cow herd. Um, that we had to get away from GMO. So the first step we did was we just stepped away from GMO corn. And we still continued raising GMO soybeans, but then all of a sudden, over the period of years, we got to meet some very knowledgeable individuals across the world. And we just slowly but surely kept putting all the pieces together that if we fix the soil, if we fix the soil health, all of a sudden the crops we were producing were way higher nutrient density. Um, it took less, it takes less feed to produce a pound of beef than it used to, or a pound of pork than it used to, because the nutrient density is in the, is in the grains that we're producing and feeding through our livestock. Um, that's, that's pretty much where we started with that. Um, 
we we had been no-tilling some of our crops since 1998 and had no idea what we were doing to influence soil health um, until we got caught in a big rainstorm a wet spring and we were, once again we were focused on production we weren't looking at soil health we'd had a big rain during the night we were trying to cut triticale to get it chopped for silage and it was getting so tall we couldn't get it to our equipment anymore I told Dawn just go out and cut let's see what happens and she cut all day and never left the track we came in later in the evening with the choppers and chopped it all and never left the track it's like what what just happened how, how come we didn't rut this whole field up you know we everybody that day realized something had changed within the soil so that's that's when we really started looking at it Amazing. And, and maybe kind of talk about um, what you spoke to in the film and what I was addressing in terms of what, what you're up against. And, and I think that's culturally, especially folks that are coming from the coast and, and recognizing what's going on in the Midwest and just how much land is run conventionally. Kind of, kind of speak to what you, what you deal with in terms of bank lending and in terms of seed distribution, in terms of equipment distribution. I think, you know, what a lot of people don't really understand is, is um, you know, from a business aspect as well as a cultural aspect, kind of the mindset, which is essentially almost a religion in terms of, you know, the understanding of, of conventional practices. Well, you're probably going to have to remind me on this because I'll never remember all the points you just hit, Nicole, but the first one I'll start with that I never realized until a few years ago when I started doing some research on this is we as farmers and producers across North America, more than likely across the world, about 85 to 90 percent of the decisions we make on our farms are based on what our input suppliers suggest we do. So the people taking the money out of our pocket are telling us what to do, which in our case was just more and more inputs less and less return. And once I figured out how to question that and look outside of that box, it wasn't until then that things really changed. The social dynamics of it is that, well, like one of your film guys here said, he could do nine mini series on what he witnessed here at the farm. And that was one of it that we have neighbors that have watched all the things we've done. I mean, I'll, our successes, our failures, and they'll ask, but they don't go home and implement it. And I shouldn't say they don't, some are. We do, we do have some neighbors that are doing what we're doing now. Um, but that, that was a big hurdle. Um, just, just an example is we, we still need products from our local co-op input supplier. And we walk in the door, it's, it's dead silence. You know, because whatever they were talking about doesn't fit our program or they were more than likely talking about us when we walked in the door. And for a while it, it bothered me, but what ended up happening was we just met a whole different world of friends. And I mean, our friends are now worldwide. You know, who would have thought I'd talk to a gal once a month in Oklahoma who was a <laughs> film producer, you know, it's just, <laughs> It's just different people that we talk to now. And yet we, we're still friends with the people in our community, but. We don't talk farming. We don't talk much. farming. We don't talk egg, egg production. Um, mm -hmm. Some will ask and, and we'll carefully answer their questions. And, and I'm saying carefully, I mean, not to, not to overwhelm them with what we're doing, but just to keep their interest is, is how I mean careful. And what, one of the other things too on, on the social aspect of it is as we were truly blessed that Carl stepped away. And so he wasn't there to tell us what to do or he didn't ask very many questions um, where a lot of farming operations are actually multi-generational. Well, if granddad and dad made it work the way they did it, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But now, the third generation is starting to get curious and we're, we're we've been questioned lately about that um they're starting to get curious and they're wondering how they can take this back to the operation and you know kind of slide it under the radar and prove that this this will work and you know 
when the teach or when the student is ready, the teacher will come. And you know, I mean, unfortunately, it's it sometimes takes death of a family member to be able to, for people to start, you know, these practices. And and that's the sad state of some operations. Yeah. Well, speak, maybe speak a little bit to the economics. I mean, at the end of the day, um, there has to be economic incentive and, and creating change, there's certainly a risk economically um, without laying all your, all your numbers here on live webinar, 500 people. <laughs> um, if you wanna maybe just speak to, you know, that, that aspect of it and because that's always, that's always the case. If you wanna speak to, to a conventional farmer, and now of which we're dealing with bankruptcies like we've never seen before and suicides like we've never seen before. I mean, people are in dire straits. So um, yeah, just maybe if you could speak to the economic factor in terms of your transition process. So that was, that kind of goes back to your opening questions. What, 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 what finally got us to change? And, you know, Gabe Brown's got to be a really good friend of mine and Dawn's and, Gabe kept telling me, you got to quit looking at production, production, and you have to look at profit per acre. And when I finally started looking at it as a profit per acre, that's when everything changed. I, I realized I'm not going to be the Redwood County corn growing champion, nor do I want to be. But when it comes to a bushel of corn produced at the lowest cost possible, we're right there and we're still maintaining respectable yields. Soybeans, same deal. And it wasn't until we looked at it as a profit per acre that we realized that we don't we don't have to have the high yields because we now have the nutrient density in those feeds. We we did realize that to maximize the profit per acre on that, it has to go through our livestock because nobody's really pre paying us a premium here locally for higher protein corn or higher protein soybeans or or that type of thing. So. That was that was really the big step, it was the profit per acre. As far as sitting down at the bank, it was trying to get our oh. our um, numbers to fit into their program that is is set up in more of the conventional operation parameters. Our our banker, I'm usually the one that goes in and talks to him, and he would just throw his hands up and say, "Give me your numbers." Tell me where to input them in here as expense and income. And we'll just, we'll make it, we'll make it flow through. So it, it goes past everybody that it needs to. And because I would spend more time sitting in his office, trying to explain what I was trying to do that as a lender, they had no experience with at all. And it's like, well, where's that coming back on January one? When we, when we look at your balance sheet, I was like, probably not going to be there January 1, but January 1, two years from now, it'll be there. And it, it's really been a struggle to, to get it in a fin flow at the bank or on paper for them. Um, as far as cost of production, we, I haven't done the math comparing it to my neighbors for a couple of years right now, but in our region using average cash rent, on the land, which is the fairest way to do it for a county. Our cost of production on a bushel of corn that year was $2.59 a bushel. The highest grain price we saw that year locally was $3.25. And my neighbors are at $3.25 to $3.75 a bushel. So even at $3.25, Don and I still had the ability to make money in a local commodity market, even though we run it all through our livestock. Well, let's um, let's maybe talk about just kind of what has happened since the film. I mean, that was that was quite a point. I was just thinking about just by virtue of preparing for this, thinking about about that particular time when you guys walked into a talk given by Zach Bush, and <laughs> I just thought to myself, well, there they are, <laughs> um, and I know, and I, I know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and we were we were chasing you down an hour and a half from St. Paul, um, trying to get you to say yes to this, which I know is, I mean, it, as all of you can probably imagine, it takes a, a certain amount of courage and vulnerability to allow a, 
a film crew into your home and your farm and your story. And um, ever since then, you guys have been highlighted by National Geographic and NBC and General Mills and I mean, local news stations. So, um, you know, like many, many farmers, you just want to do what you do and get up in the morning and work your operation and make dinner at night and have that be your day. But you've really ventured into this point of speaking and, and being part of the circuit of regenerative within the regenerative movement. So um, just share a little bit just about about what's happened and, and what that's felt like for you in the process. <laughs> well, we've learned education is really, really important. <laughs> so, I mean, we continue to educate ourselves. You can't possibly learn enough to, to, to take all of this in and and to apply it on the land. So that's one thing that we continue to do is, is just to expand our education and then to turn around and be able to share it as often and, and as much as possible with everybody else. Because if we can prevent somebody else from going through the pains that we've gone through both financially and operationally, it, it, it's worth it. Even one person, it's worth it. Um, so that's one of the biggest keys and just playing with things I'd say playing, but experimenting, I guess, with crops. Yeah, so so since the film was made, we've done a lot of experimentation and implemented a lot of things. I mean, I, I never thought I'd be back raising hogs, producing pork, and we're, we're doing that on a grass. Um, obviously, in the summertime here in Minnesota, we got to give them shelter in the winter. But but we're doing that. And we, we did our research on it and figured out how to do it. Um, poultry, I never imagined in my lifetime I would be butchering chickens again, nor did I want to from the way we did it when I was a kid. Through the help of a landlord and education, we've got some really nice equipment. We've set up our own harvest facility and we're, we're back butchering chicken. I never picked eggs one, one day in my life. I pick eggs every day now. Um, you know, it's in, in the additional enterprises we've added, we did our research first, got comfortable with it and started mm. not necessarily on a small enough scale always, but, but we did it. And we've also been approached by three landlords, um, that want their land managed regeneratively which is is really a blessing we really didn't expect to see that in our area this quickly um and so we're kind of working through those parameters and and trying to figure out how to make all that work both operationally and financially also so it's more education yeah well, speaking of, you told a really great story um, about veterans that are now spending time on your farm. Um, will you speak to that organization? It's really, really amazing story. Yeah, it's, uh, so Dawn's always been very active in the legions since she got out of the service and, and came back here home. Um, and she, she switched legions to, to serve with her dad at a legion post in a larger town than what we normally go to. And all of a sudden, a group called the Eagles Healing Nest, which is based about two hours north of us, their main facility is, came to our town and bought um, an old, an older building and and turned it into what they, they still call it Eagles Healing Nest, but, but it's for veterans that have gone through the rehabilitation programs at the main facility and they're expected to come down here and and live on their own and function get get themselves back into society and uh so dawn going to the legion meetings every month because she's on the board these guys would always offer well we can come out and help we can come out and help you know why isn't grant here well he's still working at the farm we'll, we'll come out and help well as a farmer it's like you know, some help that's offered isn't always help. It can actually slow you down a lot. And I struggle with that. And I probably put these guys off for six months. And finally this fall, Don had a little back issue. And and I thought, you know what? I need help. And we got these guys out to help us. And and we're up to three guys that come out and help us. Um, 
on a regular basis now. Um, you know, they refuse to take pay. We keep track of their hours and compensate them accordingly. But they came out here just to get – our farm is so diverse. When they come out here, they're never going to do the same thing twice. Um, you know, every weekend's different weather, different time of the season. You know, one time they're working with livestock. The next time they're helping bale hay or build fences or something like that. And it was about a month ago, all three of them are out here. <laughs> they, Here we go, they, they gave us they gave us about the biggest compliment i've ever had <clears throat> <laughs> they they told us that being out on the farm doing what we do out here had helped them heal more than any of the treatment programs they've been through So in, in, in saying that and in, in doing that, um, it's helped, it's kind of helped heal us, you know, heal us too, because it's, it's that, it, that is the ultimate compliment. Um, but it's also taught Grant um, a, maybe a little bit more about me and, and my military experience and, and how I kind of pick things apart and analyze things and, and approach things from a, a completely different perspective than he's used to. And that's the way these guys operate. And so he didn't have to micromanage them when they come out. They'll stick their heads together and they'll figure stuff out um, all on their own. And darned if they don't, you know, they pick it up quick and, and, and they've got the job done in, in uh, half the time or less than half the time that it would have taken somebody else to learn something from brand spanking new. And I have to give them credit. And they've been they've healed. I mean, the, the beauty of a sunset means the world to them. You know, the, the beauty of a deer running across the, the landscape, that means the world to them. Um, and so it's just been so cool to, to bring them, you know, into our fold and, not, and also be included into their family that they've created there at the, at the nest in, in Redwood Falls. So it's, it's a win-win for us. Um, and we look forward to to working with them long into the future. The, the biggest thing that I've taken away from it personally is we have one landowner that we rent land from that's talked about as we rebuild soil health, as we fix our farms, the lands that we own and operate, we should also be fixing the community. And that's where these guys step in our life. That's where the big light bulb came on that, hey, besides fixing our soil, besides producing uh, awesome meat proteins and green proteins and stuff, we're helping out the community to rebuild the community. And that, mm -hmm. I mean, that just, that kind of brings it into the whole, you know, we've always been taught or it, part of the, part of when I learned how to make this farm function properly was we're managing an ecosystem and these guys fit into our ecosystem and they're mm -hmm. a key part of it right now. And, and we, we encourage these guys all the time when they're out here, if they see something that they think they could make a business of their own or add to our operation as another added value commodity coming off of here, do it. And it's, it's just fun hearing the, the ideas that come up from these guys as they spend days out here helping us. And, and uh, it's, it's, just, it's just really been a blessing to help them out. And obviously them guys helping us out has, has really been a blessing for our workload. Yeah. I think we would live in a very different country if there was civil service of being on a farm for a year outside of high school. If that was required. I think about that a lot. And um, it really is a testament, and this is for all that are, are watching, is that um, obviously anybody can farm and anyone can be learning this. And um, and it is really, you know, a, a bridge keeping opportunity for communities. I think a lot about the disparity between urban and rural. Um, I think it was really telling in this election. If you look at the election, there was, there's a massive disparity between urban and rural communities. Um, and in this space, ultimately food, this is everything. <laughs> it's just, it means all of us. So we have the capability of creating you know, bringing schools onto farms and, um, you know, former 
prisoners. I mean, there's so many opportunities for organizations to, to implement farming and to certainly healing, but community building for sure. It's an amazing story. Thank you for, for sharing. We've also, we've also done that. We've, we've asked the local ag teacher in the high school, middle school and high school, to come out and look at what we're doing. And, and by no means did I, did I ever want to change her way of thinking. I just wanted her to show, a, show her a different way of farming. And for years, she turned us down and didn't come out to the academies and didn't come to field days. And all of a sudden, it's hit her that I think I should maybe go out and look at what they're doing and find out what they're doing. So we're, we're supplying educational materials back to the school for her to help teach teach about soil health and regenerating regenerating agriculture you know and mm. and, it, and it's fun meeting her because as a teacher she explained it to me one night when she was here that I have to reach these kids when they're in second grade I have to reach them in fifth grade so it gives them an idea that it's stuck in their mind as they're going through school and then she says I really need to catch them again in seventh and eighth grade so I get them when they're ninth through senior high and going out of school. And it, it just amazed me that that's how long the education process takes too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I wanna, I wanna kind of get into, we had talked a little bit about before, just about you know the impact in, in terms of brands changing their ways. General Mills is a big name that many people are hearing about. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> Apologies. Um, uh, yeah, so I mean, I know they've been out there and then you know that particular story about the CEO of General Mills and why he wanted to start, you know, implementing regenerative practices and creating education for General Mills farmers. Um, and I know they've been out there. They're based in St. Paul. So can you all share a little bit about that? Just I know they've been out there four or five times and learning from you all and, and you all talking to them just about marketing and what this looks like for a major brand to be taking this on, which is exciting. Yeah, it's uh, it's been an eye opener for us out here. Um, we've had different groups from 10 to 12 to as much as a busload of different General Mills employees um, out here from throughout the company. And when they come out here, we're Usually Gabe Brown and Ray Archuleta are here to uh, help us teach them about soil health. In four hours. We get four hours. <laughs> we get four hours to try to teach 15 years of our life, you know, in four short hours. It was, um, for us, this was a big decision for Dawn and I, um, whether we really wanted to share with a large corporation are they just going to use what we teach them as a marketing tool and once again the farmer gets nothing out of it um they get increased margins or a different way to market their product and um, to be real honest with everybody on here we have not seen that from them in fact what's happened is i think it's really neat um the people that we've gotten to visit with over their visits being out here it's like oats is our big deal for 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 Cheerios. We got to get the glyphosate residue out of the out of the Cheerios that we're making. How do we do that? We got the opportunity to show them how to do it here on the farm. And the main reason they were worried about it is because honestly, we quit growing oats 20 years ago because it, we couldn't find a market for it. It wasn't a competitive product going into the commodity system we were selling into. So what they're seeing is they're losing their source of oats and they're seeing the quality degrade. So they wanted to go help the oat farmers. So they put together educational programs, one-on-one -on -one consulting to help farmers learn about soil health and how they can regenerate their lands. And um, it's, it's really been, it's really been an eye opener that way as far as working with a large corporation. At the end of the day, when these people leave, the best part is, is dealing with them on an individual level and teaching them how it affects their lives as employees of the company or just, just people on this earth, how it affects them. That's been the biggest eye opener. It's, 
they're they're like kids. They're like kids getting back on that bus. I would I would love to be a fly on that bus and be able to hear what those conversations are as they head back to the Twin Cities. They're just they're excited, and you see the the ahas and and just you know just the reality of how beautiful it really is. You know, out here on our farm, we get to sh you know share that with them, but just it gives them hope. And I th I think throughout this. I'm hoping that however many people are on here right now get that is that's we want hope we want to we want people to understand that there's hope out there you know most most of these employees they have a garden at home and it's like well you're doing it on this large scale on your land how do we do it at home well that's where the, the gardening conversations come in and, and I mean it, it doesn't matter what scale we are if if we're trapped it, it, if we're locked by land base, we can all change how we manage our land base. If we if we rent land or own land, you know your backyard, whatever community gardens, it's all there. We we just and that's what Dawn says. If we can give them hope that they can change how they do their own gardening at home, it's 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 just fun to see the light bulb come on. That even though we're considered farmers and large scale or however you want to look at us it's still all of us involved on the earth that can change how soil functions as far as a garden a lawn anything it's 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 all of us yeah absolutely I, I remember talking to Jonathan Lundgren and we talked about this before and he was saying you know at the end of the day we have to change culture and in this kind of convenience culture of ours, our Amazon, you know, we can hire a drone and drop whatever we want to our front porch. Um, maybe, maybe talk a little bit about, about what you see, see working in different communities. It's something that we're, we're working on here in Oklahoma is building a soil health coalition, but so importantly, marketing and figuring out, you know, how to reach bigger cities so that, like you said in the film, Don, you know, the, the consumers driving the bus here. So maybe just talk about, you know, what, where do you see things working, different models, different direct markets? I think, you know, what's really interesting now in this strange time of COVID is that all the bottlenecks of our current system are just breaking from cold storage to transportation to, you know, pile up for processing plants. Um, and then the ones that have a direct market in place, um, your daughter and son-in-law, <laughs> they're up 500, 1,000%, you know, which is the really good news in this challenging time of ours. So yeah, maybe just talk about that in terms of markets, the regenerative markets that you think are working and what we need to do on a much larger, larger scale. Well, initially when we started this, you know, our thought was is that we had to run two hours east to get to Minneapolis, St. Paul to hit that market. It's, it's proven to be completely the opposite. We've, we've got a local market right here. Um, it, it took us a while to realize that. I mean, we spent a lot of time on the road trying to, trying to get our urban cus cousins to, to purchase our product. But as a producer looking at this, if it's something that you're thinking about stepping into, really look locally. It, it may take time to develop it, but the market is there locally. Um, direct marketing is, uh, is something you should study and take classes on it and yes. figure that out um, because it's not as simple as just putting your shingle out and they're all going to come running to you. There, there's marketing out there. There's many, many people across this nation that have done it very successfully and offer training on it whether it's online or in person. I wish, I wish we'd have looked at that more before we started, but hey, we're here and it's going. And, um, it, and, it, and it can be on any scale. I mean, if it's just vegetables, if it's just seasonal, the markets are there, the, the, the consumers are there. It's just a matter of us as the producers finding that consumer and getting that connection. But I think the bottlenecks that she's talking about is one thing that we learned this year is 
is huge in that we don't have a lot of small processing facilities in out here in the rocks and cows country. Um, and, and that's reared its ugly head now for almost a year. And um, it's this way nationwide. Um, and that's something that the powers that be are working really, really hard to, to try to fix, but that doesn't happen quickly. Um, and we're waiting, you know, somewhat not very patiently <laughs> um, for that to, to smooth itself out. Um, with, with, with what you mentioned, Nicole, the breakdown in the system, if we could have found harvest capacity to meet our demand, I have no idea how much the kids would have sold. I, I just, I can't imagine it. I mean, one month with shortages in our freezers waiting for processing dates, their sales went up 2,600%. And we were short on product. You know, all of a sudden the consumer, all of a sudden the consumer wanted to know where the product was coming from, how it was raised, and they wanted to tie to us, and it was just amazing. And like Don said, to this day we're we're still um, it's it's uh, we've got very good relationships with our processors, um, but we're, we're we still need more slots than we can currently get. Mm -hmm. Well, explain, explain that just to the everyday lay person. I think it's hard for a lot of people to understand why that's happening. Um, you know, I'm sure COVID obviously, but why in terms of the system, why is it so difficult? In my mind, I mean, I, we talked about this before. It's like, I, I just wish in every county across the country, there were local humane abattoirs, you know, available to us. It's just amazing that that's not available. So explain why why it's, it's made so difficult or so challenging. Well, for for us, one of the hurdles is um, as we started down this path, the, the the individual pieced products that we sell to the consumer—a ribeye, a, a roast, a pork chop—has to go through a USDA inspected facility. So we have to have USDA inspection over our animals as they come off of our trailers going into the processing facility and, and check for health and humane handling and all that type of stuff. There are very few of those in the state of Minnesota. And in fact, we, it was closer and easier for us to run to South Dakota to do it when we started doing this. And we, we've got a great relationship out there with that processor, it's just across the border, but that was our big catch there. Then all of a sudden, the system fails. We did get some state equal to processing allowed to do what we needed, but they were just so overwhelmed by basically what happened was a panic. The store shelves were bare. Consumers wanted product. They bought freezers. They wanted inventory. So their families didn't go hungry. And it just overloaded the system. And, and to this day, we're, we're still overloaded as crazy as it sounds, we're, we're still overloading the system to get as much product to the consumers as they, they want and, and desire. Yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty overwhelming. Again, all the more reason to hyper-localize and create community around, you know, autonomous zones and systems to where we're all taking care of each other and knowing exactly where food's coming from. You know, part, um, part, of, part of what came out of this was it just reinforced to me, um, like probably about the time I was getting out of high school, it was, it was encouraged to go to college and get a four-year degree. And we took, we took the trades out of our high schools to, to, to allow these students to experience trades. You know, in Minnesota here, the last trade school that taught meat cutting um, closed about 10 years ago, I'm thinking, they, because there was no students coming to keep that program going. Now, in the state of Minnesota, we, we as cattle producers, hog producers of all sizes and shapes are desperately, we've got a school lined up to start teaching it again, and, and hopefully we get students in there to fill this need that we need in rural America. Yeah. Wow. 
Um, I want to switch gears a little bit because it's so important to, to share this story about you, John, um, and particularly when uh, all of us were lucky enough to be together in Kansas on Gail Fuller's farm and Zach was there and he gave a talk and, um, you know, was, was connecting all the dots in terms of human health and soil health and all that he speaks to in terms of all of these chronic diseases that we're dealing with in terms of inflammation and, um, you know, the correlation between human health and soil health. And John, you had an epiphany right next to me and it was really extraordinary to witness and you just broke into tears and, and really shared the details about your own journey and, and, and dealing with cancer and fighting cancer and winning is really extraordinary. Congratulations. Um, but your realization that this may have been why you married a farmer of which you never said you would never ever do. <laughs> I think you said that was never gonna be the case. And then all of a sudden along came Grant. Um, it's really such a beautiful story. And you know, so much of Farmer's Footprint uh, as well as I'm sure everyone listening is, is the connection between human health and soil health. So will you share that, that kind of epiphany and that correlation? So um, when I was 15, I lost my mom to breast cancer and she was 34 years old. And, um, you know, I was 15 years old. And, um, but later on, my sister was diagnosed with breast cancer and subsequently passed away from it also. And I was, you know, being checked and, and, and being super, super cautious about things. And my 40th birthday present was a diagnosis of breast cancer. And, um, you know, knowing that my sister and my mom had passed away, I pretty much figured that I was going to have the same fate. Um, but I did it. And all going on 19 years later, I'm, I'm still standing. But in, in, since you did the filming, I have also lost my sister's daughter, my niece, to breast cancer. Mm -hmm. These were all in, the early, in their early 30s. And I've always wondered, you know, what, what, what caused that genetic component? And, and why, why was I still standing? Um, I, and I think a lot of cancer survivors wonder that same thing. But particularly for me, because it was so insidious in, in my family tree, why am I still here? And sitting there listening to Zach talk about that and and knowing what our story was and knowing that oh my god you know we could potentially affect that for future gen generations it, it just it there was just this cold chill and it was just like maybe that is my answer and and it was a very um, physical reaction and there was like no controlling and I went in the bathroom and I sobbed like a baby for about 10 minutes because this means so much and and having met him and asking all the questions and and poking at him and prodding him and you know just being a thorn in his side a lot of times um it's so important to to understand that your food comes from that soil that soil needs to be healthy in order to for us to have healthy bodies. And Zach presents it so eloquently. Um, and, and when he talked about cancer and, and stuff, it just really hit me right in my heart. Um, and having lost my niece now too, and knowing that my children are also BRCA1 positive, they have the genetic anomaly. It makes it just that much more important because, you know, that potential is still there. And we need to fix this. And if we can help fix this, if I can help fix this, I want to. There's a reason why God put me right here, right now. And if that's it, you know, then I'm just gonna talk loud and stupid as, <laughs> as I can to get people to understand the connection. Yeah. yeah. I thank God every day that I'm still here. I really do. Um. <laughs> yeah. 
It's a beautiful thing too, to, I know you all have spoken to this, um, just about implementing these practices into the rest of your life. This isn't just about farming. It's about right relationship and edge effect abundance and, you know, circulatory flow. And I mean, I think a lot about that in terms of my own life and my own relationships, my own business and my own, you know, not about hierarchy and control and, and, you know, um, taking over, but rather what is, you know, what is collaboration and everything that we do and right relationship. And, um, maybe talk about that a little bit, just with each other and your relationship to this ecological system that you're working through, as well as your community and how you've, you know, incorporated this, these ecological principles and essentially biomimicry into, into your own life. It's really simple. It's made farming fun. We were we were to a point we we're to a point where we really wondered if we should really continue. And now, as we're working with nature instead of fighting nature um, on a, on a daily basis, we have discussions about well, this all of a sudden is a problem. What can we do with nature to make it work and to make it function? And it, it's just it's just changed the way we look at things every day you know especially during the growing season it's 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 more now about observation and looking at what nature is trying to tell us or what we're still bucking around or fighting around and how we can get closer to working with nature and still produce still still feed the world still feed our customers but but we're doing it at an elevated plane of nutrition now nutrient density with everything we do it's um the, the 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 neighbors that have that have started converting into this this way of farming it's a constant conversation with them to help keep encouraging them that all of a sudden they hit a wall and it's like well what did i what did i just hit now and we'll help them get through that or, or get them to the resources to help them get through it it's um the, the biggest thing is, is when the aha moment hits that producer that we've been helping or trying to direct, when that hits them that, hey, we don't need all that nitrogen or we finally had a successful cover crop and look, look at what just changed. We reduced herbicide in half and we didn't have to do that second pass of spray. All of a sudden it, it starts clicking. And it's just so much fun to see that on their faces and see, it see can the be pretty emotional. I mean, to see a big, a big burly farmer run up and, and bear hug Grant and, and just tell him, thank you. You know, I mean, that's something to behold. Yeah, that's, <laughs> but you know, I, I guess I have to speak, uh -huh. I have to speak towards the, um, I think in, in one of the things that we experienced in, more of the conventional world is is the competitiveness you know you're competing for land you're competing for yields bushels all that kind of thing um, but when we change to this regenerative path and the further we get down it the more we try to stress to everyone that this is so much more of an open community and I think that's one of the hardest things for people to grasp is that we are truly a phone call or an email or a text message away. There's no stupid question. We're always available. Um, we don't want anybody to be discouraged because this does take time. But this, the community is worldwide and they're, they're so willing to share and that's what has been so heartwarming and um, just wants us to keep on going and, and you know, make the, farm, the family bigger. Yeah. There are. Yeah, that, sorry, go ahead. It, it amazed me at one of the last academies that we hosted here, um, Dawn and I were bold enough to say it at the beginning of the academy and then these academies that i'm talking about are three day in depth um, on the farm in the classroom teaching soil health academies 
And we were bold enough at the last one to get up in front of 45 students and tell them that this is not a big event in your life. This, this is going to be a life-changing event in your life when you figure out that soil is alive, it can be healed, it can be fixed, um, and we can still make a living off the land that we're farming and probably make more money than ever. I got a phone call from one of the students. Uh, they had left, they left River Falls on Thursday afternoon. They, he was there with another student. They got 10 miles down the road and they looked at each other and they said, damn, Grant and Dawn were right. As they're driving down the road, they were not looking at agriculture as the way they did when they showed up three days previous. And, and that's, that's why Dawn and I pushed so hard to help do this and help educate everybody we can, because it does change the way you look at life, at the environment, at the whole ecosystem we as farmers are working in. And the, the, the surprise to me was, as this guy was explaining all this to me, is he says, you know, over the weekend, we started snooping around in our local community, and they found a group that was already there in their local community that was already doing the principles that they had just been taught. So now all of a sudden, these guys got welcomed in. It wasn't the big secret <laughs> community <a> <laughs> any, anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I want to open it up to to some questions. I've got a few coming in, um, but feel free to uh, throw them into the chat room. Um, one that just came in, uh, what are your specific practices um, that you're using to improve the soil? The specific, specific practices on our, our pasture line, our range line where the cattle graze all summer is um, managed grazing. Um, the, the key to it is the rest and recovery. You have to watch what the plants are telling you if they're rested and recovered far enough that they can be grazed again. On our, on our cropland, um, 10 years ago, we made the switch to 100% no-till on the last crop we weren't no-tilling. But the key to making no-till work is implementing cover crops all the way along there. That's, that's just huge for us. The, the cover crops are our tillage tool. They are our compaction breaker. They are harvesting nutrients and bringing them up for the next crop we're going to grow. They're, they're bringing nutrients up for the livestock that we graze across there. That would be the, the, key, the key ones. Yeah, as Uncle Ray likes to tell us, just cover it. Yeah. <laughs> just cover all of it. Um, keep covering it. What what's been the biggest and hardest challenge? Patience. <laughs> oh my God! Yeah. <laughs> Patience. Yeah. Um, so just just to address part of that is we learn a new technique or we learn about a new cover crop or. A, a group of cover crops that can do this for us. We're working with nature. We only get one chance a year to do it. You know, we got to get it planted. We got to get it in there. Um, and then we got to wait till the next year to see if it was a success or not. Um, that's the biggest thing is patience. Um, I never realized it until we met Ray. You know, the way we were farming, our soils were addicted to what we were doing, all the synthetic fertilizers and herbicides and fungicides that we were using and like Don said before we don't want other farmers to make this mistake we went cold turkey on some of our land away from that system to this system it's a failure it will be an expensive failure you need to wean the system off and do it systematically um, the cover crops that we seed um, are multi-species cover crops to help heal the soil. Like I said before, to harvest nutrients, to do all that stuff. So we'll, we'll plant turnips, radishes, sorghum, sedans, grasses, depending on what our following crop are, is gonna be or what our resource concern that we need to fix in that field is. That's how we decide what we plant out there. Um, our cover crops primarily come after we harvest small grains in August, so we still have about two and a half months of a growing season here and we can grow a lot of cover crops to fix our 
problems in our soils or to harvest nutrients or to grow feed for our livestock. Somebody asked what are the best cover crops? And I know that that, that is, you know, it depends on the ecological place wherever you are and maybe speak to, to where you are specifically. I mean, that, that, that's something that has to do with an ecological system based on that location. And it can change here in Oklahoma from one side of the state to the other, so. Absolutely, yeah. it changes here, it? here in the state of Minnesota, it changes also, but there are getting to be very reputable seed suppliers out there now that understand soil health and what their seeds can do to help producers down that path. And if you're going in the first time to ask for a cover crop seed and they don't ask you what your resource concern is, what problem you're trying to fix on your farm, you should keep going, keep going through, keep shopping for <laughs> seed suppliers. If, they, if they're really out there to help you, that should be one of the first things that comes up in the conversation with them. Or you might end up with a pink seed, as we witnessed. <laughs> yeah, or, 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 I mean, here in corn, soybean, and sugar beet country, I mean, you, you can really mess things up for your, for your next growing season. You can actually do more damage mm -hmm. than good. Yeah. The seed yeah. selection is incorrect. Yeah. Um, how do we get local farms to be educated in these practices? Start on YouTube. <laughs> yeah, that's the one thing the internet has done for us is there is just countless hours of days worth of watching on YouTube. That's the mm -hmm. quickest, simplest. Um, all throughout the nation, though, there are actual field days. I mean, hopefully we'll be doing that again um field days to go attend in in communities you might have to look a little bit to find them but you know here in minnesota we started a minnesota soil health coalition that addresses this that helps producers find their ways to these meetings or educational materials um, nrcs the natural resource conservation service which is in most counties across the united states they can usually help a producer to find um the meetings or resources needed. Yeah. Um, here in Oklahoma, we're working close with the Conservation Commission and Conservation Districts, and we've got producers like yourself, Jimmy Emans, who you all know, um, all of which become ambassadors, not only in the state of Oklahoma, but, you know, similar to you all, um, they're all readily available, you know, to answer questions, which is really great. Um, Let's see, what else? If, could you give some context on soil health and the land appraisals for farmers? What will it take to bring soil health to the forefront? Wow. <laughs> that's uh, that might be a whole other webinar, but it's an it, important one. It is, but the, the simplest way I, I think I can speak to that is, um, it really opened my eyes to it that we can fix what we've done in agriculture, at least in row crop country. We have soils here that our soil organic matter was down to 1.6 and 1.9%. And soil organic matter is just a measure of carbon. We as human beings survive on this earth based on carbon. In this region, I did the research before the plow was here, before we broke this to grow grains, this region was at 11 to 12 percent soil organic matter, carbon levels. So, in just a few short years of farming, we have depleted a very large percentage of it. And it, it just hit me and dawn. It's like, how how long do we have left if we keep going at this pace with all the tillage, with all the synthetics that are being applied? It's like there, there's going to be nothing left for the kids if we keep doing it this way. On our farm, we've taken those same soils and built them up to over 5% organic matter in, in a very short amount of time. And, and, and our goal, I mean, I don't know if we'll see it in our lifetime, is to get back to that 10, 12% organic matter. That, that would be great if we can get there. And that's, that's our goal is to get back to what the good Lord gave us originally when our forefathers came and broke the prairie. And we're still gonna be producing crops. We're still gonna be feeding the world. 
up. Um, speaking of that, somebody asks, how do you how do you wean off glyphosate, and are you still using it? I will admit we still use it. It's still a tool in the toolbox, as Gabe would say. It's the tool in our toolbox because I will never do tillage again. Um, leaving that soil undisturbed is so important for us. Uh, I just, as a kid, I loved tillage and now I've grown to hate it. I just despise it. And if you see what Southwest Minnesota looks right now, you'd understand why. I've had two windstorms and we got towns with four to six inches of topsoil blown into them. But also realize that we vastly reduce the, um, the amount that we use and we only use it when we really, really need it to work for something very specific. To, to address what Dawn just said is, we used to spray glyphosate oh, two, sometimes three times a year before we started going down this path. We now spray glyphosate once, I'd have to look through the records, but probably about once every three to four years is all we need to use it now. And and I, I still don't like using it, but what Dr. Alan Williams has taught me is that as our soil life got healthier, the biology in our soil can digest that product or any of those products much quicker. And, and obviously we've increased our rainfall infiltration. So we're holding what we're applying on our land instead of washing it to the, to the water streams. I, I, I want to get 100% away from it. And we will. And so your your weaning process is 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 what exactly? Just implementing cover crops and creating the diversity. I absolutely to yeah. wean the soil to wean the soil off of what we were doing. The best way I can suggest is cover crops. That a successful cover crop will do the most to improve the soil health and get the biology started back in that soil again. And 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 ha you have to start reducing the synthetics, otherwise you're just gonna keep killing that biology that you just work to build up. Gotcha. Um, somebody asked, is the USDA supportive in, in helping at all? Not necessarily I'm USDA, gonna... but... Not necessarily okay. USDA, but NRCS is. Their, their programs have come a long ways over the years since Don and I started. The one thing I, I really would like to see the NRCS, the, what these programs are, is they're cost share assistance programs to farmers. It's an incentive to try new practices or different practices, such as no tilling or cover crops. I personally would love to see these incentive programs be based on seven to 10 years instead of three to five years the way they currently are. As farmers, you know, farmers figure out how to farm programs. I'll just say it that way. We can figure out how to make money on a program if you're desperate enough to do that. The reason I want these programs to be longer term if there are gonna be incentive programs to help farmers with this is because in a seven to 10 year program, somewhere in there, the good Lord is gonna slap that farmer hard enough that he gets it. What the program is designed to do to show them how it's changing their soil. And I, I guess that would be my comments on that. Yeah. You wanna expand on that, Don? Were you gonna say something? Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> that I heard a chime in. Um, let's see. How do we advocate as a consumer to our farms? Buy local. Yeah, if you can find the farm to buy local. Yeah. That's that. that I, I don't know if this would quite answer that question, but to advocate other farms. Originally, when we started direct marketing, we looked at other people doing it as adversaries or competition. If we now work with those same people doing the same thing, we share ideas. How can we push it farther and how can we do this? We we share our harvest dates just so we all keep our livestock current and our freezers full. And yeah. I guess the, the other part just comes back to the education side of it. Um, 
to, to those that don't farm, well, it doesn't matter. To the world we live in, all the flooding we dealt with the last four years, you know, two years ago, I was trying to go down I-29 three different times, the road was closed from flooding. If we regenerate the soil, if we fix soil health, if we fix the biology in the soil, we will not have those problems. Dr. Alan Williams explained it to me, Hurricane Harvey, if farmers in the region where that rainfall had hit had only increased their soil organic matter 2%, there would have been no flooding from Hurricane Harvey. As we increase and build soil health and fix the soil, the rainfall infiltration rates increase. It, it's, this is, this is a global issue. And if, if we can fix the farmland that we're farming and our rangeland, manage that correctly and increase organic matter instead of decreasing it, we can, we can have a big effect on the nation. Yeah. Yeah, I remember when we came out there the second week to shoot, we were dealing with, I mean, half that week we were covered in water. Serious flooding, just getting to your farm. Yeah. Um, so much, this is such an important topic that I think about a lot. Can you talk about the need to change the crop insurance program that would encourage good behavior versus bad, bad behavior? Oh, uh, Dawn says go for it. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's, it's, even, it's even deeper than just crop insurance. Um, it, it's what our farm bill crop insurance, it's everything tied together that's that's pushed us to produce corn in my region to produce produce corn and soybeans, corn and soybeans. It, it goes back to our ag lenders. Just to try to explain, explain it briefly. Well, I should start with the crop insurance issue first. So far, as long as my yields don't drop, my crop insurance adjuster hasn't said anything about what we do because we've been doing it for a long time. And, and originally we were probably in violation of some of the allowed practices. Since then, crop insurance has come a long way. A lot of our friends sit on those advisory groups to help rewrite what crop insurance allows us to do as our management practices change. As a producer, I can prove my technique through crop insurance and still carry my crop insurance, even though it might not be covered under their guidelines. Um, so to answer the question fully is, as producers in this country, as our crop, as our farm bills have been pushed along, it's been to produce corn and soybeans, produce it as cheap as we possibly can. As a producer, I go into my banker to borrow money to put the crop in, we have lost the diversity in our cropping system because our bankers tell us we got to insure, in my region, the two highest insurable commodities, which is corn and soybeans. So that takes small grains out of the equation, wheat, oats, barley, anything like that. It takes it out of that equation because our, our lenders don't want to lend us money because we can't insure a high enough return on our investment. So it's, it's just a multifaceted program that has taken the diversity out of our farming operations. In our operation, we figured out how to put small grains back in there. Our small grains are now a seven way mix that we feed back through our poultry and our hogs and even our cattle as a protein source to, to utilize it right here on the farm. We're not putting them into a commodity market. So it's, it's a big, long, nasty web and I hope I didn't confuse people, but those of you guys in the farming business understand what I'm saying. Yeah, there's a lot, I've, I've learned there's a lot of like private insurance companies and now with all, there's a lot of money in this space now in terms of impact investment um, uh, groups. Uh, have you seen private insurance where kind of they're stepping outside of the system to create um, a model to actually give solid backup to grow real food? We've heard talk of it and we've talked to some people, some individuals about it, but we haven't really, really seen anything yet. We, we haven't experienced it or yeah. dove into it yet. Gotcha. Got it. Um, somebody asked, have you ever looked into using key line design for capturing infiltrating water erosion control? Yes, I have looked into it. I've studied it and 
once again, I'm just trying to get away from burning diesel fuel. So I firmly believe my cover crops are, I guess in my mind, my cover crops are doing what we need to do to retain as much water as we can on our farm. We've, we've gone from less than an inch of water infiltration to eight to 12 inches of water infiltration on our farm with doing cover crops and no-till. So um, we're, we're blessed with normally good rainfalls here. We really don't have to route or move our water here where we farm. Yeah. Got it. Um, let me go back a little bit. Somebody asked, how do you think impact of the current corn and bean price will be on regenerative ag? Um, fall CBOT for corn today was 455 and beans at 1188. Um, yeah, thoughts on that? It's not good. It is not good. It, it's going to push us right back to that point where we were at that we talked about before, production, production, production. High commodity prices, as high as we've gotten right now, are going to push us in this region to try to hit 300 bushel acre corn across every acre. But we're going to increase the synthetics used to try to get there. And it's, it's going to shut down producers thinking of potentially experimenting with cover crops or no-till or, or another crop in their rotation, it, it's going to set us back. Yeah. Are you, are you witnessing, I mean, in that, in that case, I mean, are you witnessing conventional farmers kind of getting to a point of asking a question of, you know, I'm going to change this altogether because of that situation? Are you seeing a lot more changing their ways? I guess I'm not understanding the call. Well, I mean, I mean, are you seeing more conventional farmers by virtue of being trapped in this particular system um, wanting to transition? And can they? How can they? Yeah, they can if they do their research and do the research, get good advice on how to do their transition, their weaning off. They, they will still be able to sell $5 corn and do it with less inputs and, and at the same time they can still be looking at soil health and make their transition into that. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Um, another question, is there a mechanical solution, crimpers, cedar, to using glyphosate? We are <laughs> trying to get that program implemented here where we can, yes. Um, there, there are a lot of different ways to do it. And yeah, we, we have used the crimper here and we hope to do a lot more of that in the future. The big, the biggest thing for me is the crimper is great, but the biggest thing for us that we struggle with the last year is being so wet is a successful cover crop. A successful cover crop for us just eliminates chemical use. It, it, just makes our life easier like races keep it covered so if we have a successful cover crop that we can get to the ground with a roller crimper or a chemical termination it, it, it just lightens our load a lot yeah you guys are um you've become essentially ambassadors to understanding ag right i mean are you you've basically been taking on part-time jobs of going to different operations and helping producers transition yeah have you been doing that not only in Minnesota but out of state? Yes, yeah. I've been doing I've been doing some consulting for them. Yep. Yeah. What are you What are you seeing? What do you think is is I mean, especially going out of state, it's one thing to know your particular area, but once you start kind of branching out and learning different trials and errors, what are you What are you seeing in different states? Challenges and and. The, cha the challenges really are the same everywhere. It's about most of the producers that I speak with, it still comes down to how fast can we fix what we've done in the past, whether it's a grazing operation or a row crop operation, any of that. It's, it's once again, the patience thing. But as producers, we want to get down this path as fast as we possibly can. So, you know, it's, it's encouraging the experimentation on their own farms. 
to see what gets them down that path the fastest, the farthest, the fastest. Got it. Uh, I like this question. What is the best advice you've received during your transition? <laughs> a weed is a form. <laughs> <laughs> And I say that laughing, but I know that if, if Gabe or Ray is watching this, they're, they're shaking their head, yes. It's, um, it's just in changing the filter that we see things through, I think. Right? Yeah, the greatest advice is just to sit back and observe. Mm -hmm. Mother Nature is telling you something with everything she's putting out there. Whether you think it's a pest or a problem, there's a reason that's there. And we as producers have to sit back and observe why that's there, what we can do to work closer with Mother Nature to prevent that if you if you believe it's a pest or if it's hurting a crop or livestock or anything like that. It, it's the best advice would be getting back to observing nature. Yeah, I remember when we had, I think Gabe refers to it in the film as that God moment when you mentioned that once you started abiding by nature, that bolt of lightning <laughs> hit just behind you. I know, which has nothing to do with us as a film team and everything to do with, you know, the agreement of abiding by nature. That was really an amazing moment. Um, what is your vision for your daughter and your grandchildren? That all of them that want to be involved have a place back here. And it, and it goes even beyond just our immediate family. I mean, if these veterans or anybody else, that, that, how do I say it? Since, we, since we've figured this system out, there's enough to go around. And, and hopefully they'll continue down this path. You know, Carly and Cody continue down this path. It's so obvious when you're out there in and with nature that this is the right way to do it. That I, I really hope they pick it up as, as young children growing up beside us that it, it's what they want to do in the future. We want to see them love, love what we are seeing. Mm. Nice. Yeah, abundance. Um, somebody said, you mentioned the need for marketing as an example. How might folks with different skill sets outside of agriculture can lend their expertise to agriculture? That's a good question. Yeah. As producers, we get stuck in a tunnel we're always looking for that outside voice to get us to think outside the box. You know, whether, whether they're good with finance or they're good with marketing or good with developing websites, all that type of stuff. It, it helps us as producers on the land get out of what we think we're stuck in, a, in a paradigm we're stuck in or a box we're stuck in to get us out of that box. It might be as simple as reaching out to a soil health coalition in, in a state or something like that and, and just um, explaining what your talent is and, you know, and getting your name or, or your talent out there through those, the web of all of the different um, soil health coalitions and organizations um, to say, I want to help or I, I, I know how to do this. How can I be a part of your organization? Join the organization. You don't have to be a farmer to join a soil health coalition or organization. It takes the yeah. whole community to make this all work. And the, out, the outside, the outside egg um, input has really helped us transition to where we are. Um, it, it's been amazing. Yeah, I think um, I think about that a lot every time my like small uh, dis di seed dispersal within my own community is going to restaurants and asking where they're getting their food, you know, and just to be that demanding, irritating consumer and saying, you know, where's your local farm and who are you, where are you getting it from? Because I would love to see menus in every restaurant. That's something that, you know, tap on the shoulder of the manager of a restaurant and say, you know, we want to know that 
our food is coming from our local farmers. I think that's a big win. Um, this is the million dollar question that I've been asking for years now. What are the levers to expanding the regenerative movement to reach critical mass? <laughs> no, no, no question, right, Nicole? <laughs> yeah. It's such I, important. Education. I firmly believe Dawn and I have stuck on this for years. It comes back to education. As, as, as producers on the land, it comes back to education. As consumers of the products that we produce off of the land, it comes back to educating yourself on what you're eating, what's, what, what's it, what is it doing to you, what, what's the effects of it, and are there other alternatives? You know, that, that was the one thing Carly wanted to do when she started this was to provide a, a nutrient-dense product coming off of our farm, the way it's produced, and not price it so high that only the wealthy could afford to buy it. You know, and that's, and I'm proud to say, I mean, our, our prices are higher than a supermarket, but we have to be because we, we can't process whole loads of livestock at a time. We got to do them individual or two or three at a time. Our, our actual processing costs are much higher than what's on the store shelf. So we have to charge more, but it's it, it just it just comes back to education yeah yeah. It's simple. yeah and being you know to be clear and also being a storyteller and to everyone out there and we will all have the capability of um, learning the details of the specifics of what regenerative agriculture is and and to really hunker down and stay true to, to what it is there's a lot of greenwashing in the space there's a lot of you know, ideas about what regenerative ag is and, and are actually not. Um, and I think if we have the capability of really talking about the importance of getting away from chemicals, getting away from tilling and really implementing um, nutrient dense real food as much as we possibly can, I think we all have the capability of, of being educators and, and being educated about, about what it is. So that's something really prominent in the farmer's footprint space is, is story and education and bringing in as many producers to tell their story. So um, on that note, I think we need to wrap it up. We've only got a few minutes and um, I apologize to everyone out there if we didn't get to your, to your questions. I know they keep flowing in and we'll do our best to answer after the fact, but I just wanna thank you both so much. I, I love you dearly and I'm so proud of you and I'm proud to know you and to learn your your journey over the last couple of years. And I can't wait to see what happens um, for years to come. Thanks for sticking with us. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, it, you, you know, Nicole, because I do try to call you and, and give you updates, but for us as a farm, opening up to let you do what you did here was not easy. But if there's, other, if there's other producers that get asked by some gal in California if she can come spend two weeks at your farm I would highly encourage you to do it because that this is another element of the education part you know it, it hits a different segment of society um yeah I would highly encourage you to do it I mean it trust me if somebody told me 10 years ago I'd have been talking to people on a regular basis in a public setting I'd have told you, no, it wasn't happening. But as we learned this, as we found, as we were guided down this path and realized this is the path we had to be on, I had to start talking first and now she's had to join me, so. <laughs> well, you're, you're doing a tremendous job and, and so many people are so grateful to you. I think it's, it's important to, you know, you don't, to, to farmers out there, you don't need a film crew to come and tell your story. And um, as you all can say, I mean, we all have iPhones these days and it's something that I'm working on and in, in learning these regenerative principles is applying it to media. Um, we're dealing with such persuasion technology these days and, and really not um, enhancing our better angels, <laughs> to put it lightly. 
um, in this kind of, you know, tribal landscape that we're dealing with in terms of media. But I think all of us, I think, have a now a biological obligation and, a, and a, an obligation as citizens to to tell your story. And I think people are starving for authenticity. People are starving for transparency and vulnerability. And um, I'm happy to answer questions about telling your story. It can be very short and sweet. You can do it in a minute and a half, two minutes. But I think the biggest thing is, is really sharing observation. Um, that to me is, is really an exquisite thing to watch is to say, you know, when I, once I started implementing cover crops, then I witnessed this and all of a sudden dung beetles started showing up and you know, that, that to everyday consumers is a recognition of hope and, and expansion and essentially being part of this ecological life cycle that we're all a part of. So um, to all of you out there, please, please stay in touch. And, and again, we're all available to you and happy to answer any questions in regards to regenerative practices and telling stories and um, from the Farmer's Footprint team, just a few points about how you can follow folks. Um, Grant and Dawn, Dawn Brightfruits is on Facebook if you wanna follow her. Um, Ten Creek Range is their daughter, Carly and Cody. Ten Creek Range at Stony Creek Farm on Facebook. Um, please give them a follow. Um, you still, we're putting out a new screening toolkit that you can find on farmersfootprint.us. Um, it's all available to you to share the film and, and start generating conversation and questions and more community building. Um, you're welcome to stay in touch with me, Nicole Raglan. That's Nicole without an E, N-I-C-O-L, raglan.com. Um, and that, again, like I said, I'm really, I'm working hard on, on helping farmers tell their story, not only in the States, but um, abroad in Australia as well. So, um, so that's it. Jesse just put in the links in the Q&A to follow Farmer's Footprint for the screening toolkit, as well as my website and Ken Creek Range. So do stay in touch and um, thank you both so much and keep going. And to everyone, please stay well and um, be kind to each other. Yeah. Take care. You too. Bye everybody.